Uh, hey there, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. And today I'm joined by Matt No Tap Tour, who is a friend of mine uh, over here in New Zealand. And uh, Matt, we're actually probably going to shoot this in two parts. We've got so much to talk about. Um, you are a, I guess, an MMA legend and pioneer, really, in New Zealand, as well as an NFT pioneer. And that's how we've also connected through NFTs. But um, thanks for joining me, Matt. How you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for having me here. Absolute pleasure. And um, obviously chatting about two of my favourite subjects. So, um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to what's ahead. It's interesting, eh? Because uh, it was very much a small world moment for you and I. Uh, I'm obviously was involved in combat sports through running Mana Championship and, you know, you're running uh, Hammerhead down in Dunedin as well as you know, you got the bucket list that you run, as well as being the president of New Zealand MMA. I'd obviously knew of you and about you, but to then have that small world moment where we got to know each other through the, the NFT um, community was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to have a chat. Uh, but today, Matt, what I want to talk about, because uh, I think probably a lot of people in NFT world, right, and Web3 world don't know much well they know a bit about your mma side but i really want to go deep on the mma um but before we do can you tell me about your upbringing like where were you born uh what's your heritage yeah tell me a little bit about your your childhood growing up and wherever you grew up okay yeah so um my parents were from um uh, Auckland. Well, my mother was from Dunedin, my father was from Auckland, but um, I was born there. Uh, but my grandparents, they they had a bit of different history. So uh, my father, he's um, Full Cook Island, and so my grandfather was from Atu, and my grandmother was from Mangaia in the Cook Islands. So um, they moved to New Zealand, and my father was born in Auckland. Um, then my mother's side, I've got my grandfather He's actually from Scottish descent, so he's a, a redhead Scotsman, and um, he met my grandmother in Japan, so uh, my grandmother's Japanese on my mother's side, so um, half Japanese, quarter Scottish and quarter um, uh, Japanese, sorry, half Cook, Cook Island, quarter Japanese, quarter Scottish, so a bit of a fruit salad there, please, um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting upbringing. I was born in Auckland at Middlemore Hospital in 1980. Um, and spent my first eight years up in Auckland. So um, mum was a school teacher and uh, dad worked in a variety of jobs, but uh, it was mainly in the bearings uh, business. Um, so mum being a school teacher, um, she, she would have us go to the same school she was teaching at, which was a bit different. Uh, and so when she moved schools, uh, we would have to get up and move as well. So um, it's probably, I went to three different schools in Auckland uh, for a start and then moved down to Dunedin when I was eight. So I uh, went from going to school in South Auckland, uh, went spent a couple of years at uh, St John's in Otara, and then went to St Joseph's in Otahu, and then went to a new school, Everglade. Um, so they were my three schools in Auckland, and was pretty much the most uh, fair-skinned kid in the class, and the pretty much only Japanese kid in the class as well. So, uh, yeah, there was a few sort of hard case names getting called, the old uh, pull the eyes back, ching chong stuff, and just, you know, the normal kids kids sort of stuff there. And uh, then, then we moved down to Dunedin and went from being um, uh, a lot different down here, being one of the few Polynesian people in the whole school. So it was a real flip 180. But, um, you know, I guess... Uh, you got a little bit of bullying and stuff, but what, what I did learn from that was how to adapt and how to meet people, how to make friends and stuff. So really uh, a lot of good skills learned early sort of thing. So I did enjoy that. And um, definitely a couple of big extremes going from uh, South Auckland to Dunedin at school. So, yeah, that, that's a bit about my background. Um, obviously, the Polynesian family, there's a lot of them in Auckland. So uh, a lot of Sunday afternoon dinners and a lot of big family functions. And, yeah, I, I always uh, treasure those times. Unfortunately, these days it seems to be for funerals and um, the occasional wedding, which is great. But, yeah, I, I miss our big family gatherings. So that was something that we had a lot of when I was a young fella. That's interesting. That's a really interesting heritage. Um, 
So you you're Japanese. So do you do you speak Japanese? Did you get much exposure to I guess Japanese culture? Unfortunately, I didn't, uh, Mark. Um, the uh, my mother um learnt a little bits and pieces. My my her sister, my auntie, she definitely um she uh, speaks full of Japanese and actually teaches it at a high school level. Um, so she quite often goes back and forth to Japan. Um, and it's a side, I guess, now that I'm a bit older too, that I want to explore more, um, and especially with the martial arts side of things. Um, you know, that's a real mecca of uh, a big part of my life. So I'll eventually get there and meet, meet friends and family as well that I, that I have there too. That's cool. That's very interesting. Um, let's cut it over to, I guess, your martial arts. So... How did you, I guess, how did your martial arts journey start? You talked a little bit about, I can imagine with your ethnicity, uh, knowing New Zealand as, you know, back in the old, uh, the 80s and, and like how it was, there would have been a bit of, you know, a bit of trash talk going around. Did, were, you, were you a scrapper as a kid or did you, how did you get involved in martial arts? Yeah, so I guess, um, I'll be honest, please, um, my way of dealing with a lot of this, I suppose, uh, kids being kids stuff was uh, there was enough was enough sort of thing and there would be a time where things probably would get physical. Um, and then as I got older, I, I, I used to love playing football, like rugby. That was my, my sport. And, um, you know, as you got a wee bit older, people in a small town, you start getting a bit of reputation and... Um, yeah, things just happen and there were fights and most often it was just be over silly stuff, just school kid stuff and unfortunately we were starting to get a bit bigger, we were developing and it was heading down a pathway where I was only going to end up in a couple of places, you know, and um, they weren't good places. So um, I'm really glad that I did find some good people um, and it was actually a hard case. I was working at the uh, freezing works at the time and um, I was playing football but I did hear about these these guys that were training and doing this. Uh, it was called Valley Tudo. And so I asked around and they pointed to this guy over in the corner. I was looking at him. I thought, this guy's tiny. He's 75 kgs. Well, I'll go and ask him. So I went up to him and said, oh, I heard um, you're doing some sort of fighting. Um, could I train with you guys? And he said, oh, yeah, come on up. Come on up. He said, I'll give you the address. And he wrote it down for me. And I had some friends that were going as well. So um, I decided to get a lift there with them. And it was in this tiny little basement that uh, uh, who ended up being my first trainer's um, bottom floor of his basement. And it was decked out with mats. And there was about 10 people in the room. And um, I saw them sort of moving around. I'm thinking, oh, what's this? And I saw them grappling. And um, this, to me, wasn't what I thought fighting was supposed to be. I thought we were going in like banging. So um, uh, they gave me a role, first of all, and, um, of course, they told me the rules is, that, you know, you can imitate strikes, but you can't make contact, um, but it's mainly about either trying to submit them uh, or get in a position where you're dominant, and then we'll stop it. Uh, what I didn't realise was uh, the tapping rule, and um, I was tied up pretty quickly, and I'm like, yeah, 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 stop, stop, stop. Um, this wee fella tied me up in knots pretty quickly several times in the first couple of minutes so I'm like oh man I need to learn this stuff and um, yeah basically the, these these guys uh, I found how, how humble they were um, I found out that they were just in it for um, seeing how good they could get but also found out that they were competing as well and um, this was in the year 2000 uh, I was first there so um there were a few comps on, but they weren't very major ones, and uh, they were far and few between. So, yeah, that, that's that's how I found martial arts um, and found my first trainer, John King. Um, and still to this day, he's our cage master at our events, and um, his daughter's just recently left. She was my receptionist at the gym for some time as well, and I remember when she was born. So, you know, it's a real cool lineage we've got there. That's awesome. So you essentially got into then around 2000. How long was it between, I guess, that initial training session and then uh, getting in the ring or getting in the cage? And what was the process, you know, from you going from novice through to, you know, having your first fight? Yeah, so um, 
basically I was a seasonal worker at the freezing works and the one where this person was working at, I was only out there uh, for my off season. So uh, I managed to train with them while I could. And then unfortunately I had to go back to my original plant where I was from uh, and do the season there. So I would miss quite a bit of the trainings out over the next sort of year or so. I uh, was able to do the stuff on the weekends, um, but it was, it was sporadic. So, um, it wasn't until 2003 where things got a bit more serious and um, uh, Howie Booth, uh, who, who's like a second father to me, he was um, one day working in a pub and he'd been there for a long time and he heard this Brazilian accent and he said, excuse me, where are you from to this lady? And she said, ah, oh, from Brazil. And he goes, oh, do you know about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Like he was hooked and he was just looking for any way to talk about it in his day at work. So she said, yeah, 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 my cousin, he's very good at it. And um, she said, oh, really? And what's his name? And oh, he's, he's, he's a brown belt and his name is Johnny Gee. And we're like, oh, okay. So how he's talking away, oh, right. Give me his details. What's his email address? Uh, so after that conversation, he touched base with this uh, young lad who was 22 at the time over in Brazil. Uh, at the time, he was a brown belt and um, asked him if he'd like to come to New Zealand. Uh, Johnny had said yes, and then Howie rung up 10 of us and said, right, guys, we need $500 each. Uh, we're bringing over a guy from Brazil, and he's going to train us for um, six weeks. And so um, we thought this was amazing. Um, so we all jumped at that opportunity in 2003. Um, and finally, I was actually able to train properly then because um, it wasn't just waiting for the times I could. He was there during the daytime and I was a night shift worker. Uh, so I got to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him during the daytimes uh, and the others trained at night time with him. So um, Johnny ended up staying uh, for quite some time in New Zealand, three months, and then we changed his visas around and um, we actually had our first fight together in 2003 um so he came over in january and our first fight was in april 2003 um and to be honest fleece it was an absolutely horrific experience for myself <laughs> um but i learned a lot from it and i'm really really pleased i went through the things i did so um we'll get to that in a sec but yeah look um Johnny pretty much has been over about 16 or 17 times uh, since 2003. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot. Um, you know, he's like my brother and um, we've been through a lot together. Uh, and he's now a fifth degree black belt. Um, and his his instructor, Marcelo Barangi, was the first ever red belt that was a non-gracie. So um, that's our lineage is through Barangi um, Jiu-Jitsu. Um, and, yeah, I'm really proud to say that because it is a big huge family um johnny is uh you know been a fifth degree he's obviously uh been dedicated to the sport for a long time so um yeah that, that's that's how we got into it and you know side by side we had our first fight we had a lot of fights where we would just travel around and get on the same card and yeah go and scrap and just uh yeah just just live the life and um it started off with trying to get onto as many local fights as possible, um, and then I found that it was it was just too long in between fights. Um, so, yeah, there was things that happened as well. They sort of banned uh, the MMA scene for a while. We all had to turn turn to kickboxing uh, and Muay Thai, so we did that for a bit too. Um, but yeah, I guess um, when Johnny went back to Brazil, my first real taste of uh, professionalism was over in. Um, in uh, the UK. So I spent some time in London and um, just by looking around, trying to find something with MMA, I had a couple of clubs that were nearby the place I was staying, which was the old school kickboxing uh, with the long pants and the, uh, the size shuffle. Uh, but that wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, so I did find a place uh, called Elite, um, Elite MMA. So it was in South London. It was about an hour away from where I was staying. So I had to catch two different tubes to get there, tubes and uh, two station stops. And I'd go to Elephant Castle and train and then come home. Um, but by chance, these guys that were training me were also the biggest promoters in the UK. And they had an event called Cage Rage. Um, so, yeah, they had lots of amazing shows and they would bring over people for these shows and they would also do seminars for us so uh before i'd know it the shootbox team was there 
and Vandalay Silver's there, the young Shogun Ninja, um, a lot of different guys from the old school Anderson Silver people I really looked up to. And um, uh, even at our club, we had guys like Brad Pickett, One Punch Pickett, he was there. Um, Got to roll with Michael Bisping um, quite a few times. He was a kickboxer back then and a DJ. <laughs> um, so that was back in the days. Um, yeah, so the UK scene was pretty small back then as well. So I was really blessed to be amongst a really cool core. And um, I look back at our photos and I still keep in touch with a lot from our group. Um, and we've all gone on to do stuff in MMA while like we're still involved now, 20 years later. Um whether it's promoting shows, having our own gyms, uh, going into refereeing. Yeah, it's, it's just really cool. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was where I sort of really got into MMA, made, made my pro debut, um, got to fight at places like uh, Portsmouth, uh, the Wembley um, Events Conference Centre, uh, where Cage Rose was, and just had some really cool times over there. And um, I guess that's where I saw how big this thing could really get. Uh, and also... Pride was a big event back then as well, so um, it was funny. Even guys like Herb Dean were fighting on Cage Rage, and um, it'll be it's just seeing where they've all ended up now um, has been cool. But a lot of the Japanese stars from Pride would cross over a lot to Cage Rage, so um, yeah, that that's, that was the start of things. And then from there, had a, quite a few fights around around the world, um, and Australia locally in New Zealand, and then decided to open up a gym and open up a club so that we could start uh, sharing what we'd learnt and through that also start promoting. So, yeah, it's kind of led me to here, Fleece. So, yeah, I'll hand it over to you because I've just non-stop talked. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great because I haven't heard, you know, I've got to know you really well, but I, a lot of this information, hearing these names, obviously I'm a huge uh, MMA fan, so just uh, I wasn't aware of that, that phase of your um, – of your career and your journey in the United Kingdom. I did not know about that. That's, um, that's intriguing. So you, what was your, what would you say your fight style was? Were you a grappler first? Were you well-rounded? What, what were you, how were you approaching your fights when you were in the cage? Definitely at the start was grappling predominant and was always looking to take it down. Um, and probably a good time to go back to my first actual fight. Um, she was an absolute shocker. So I, I um, did everything that uh, a student shouldn't do uh, and basically focused on all the wrong things. You know, like I, uh, I was at the Freezing Works working at the time and um, every day, because people saw the posters, they knew I had this fight coming up and you're in a factory of, you know, 50, 60 people. So uh, every time there was a new shift or a new run, someone knew beside me and they'd ask me about the fights and this went on for weeks. So it's kind of like a stuck record and by the end of it, you just I'd, I'd talk myself out of and I'd put myself here, so I had to really perform. Uh, and I had all these expectations on my head on what this fight was supposed to be. Um, it was supposed to be a knockout and it was supposed to be like WWF where I get the hands raised and all that sort of crap, you know, and uh, fully focused on that side of things and not actually what I should be doing game plan was. I sh if I'd only thought about uh, my game plan as often as I thought about this other stuff, uh, I would have been good. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of time, you know, I speed slow is a prime example the night before the fight. Uh, instead of focusing, I'm trying to screen print the back of my shorts because I turned up and I at the way and I saw everyone else had uniforms and I was just there and had my casual kids on and thought, oh, I really should look the part tomorrow. So I thought I'd screen print the back of these shorts and 2 a.m. I think we'd finish that. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, okay, that's good. Um, the DJ played the wrong ring song, so I wasn't going to walk out till he played the right song. And I'd practiced my walk out that many times, at least it was uh, ridiculous. Uh, and when the DJ played the wrong song, I was like, nah, it's not meant to happen like this. Play the right song and the promoter's going to get out there. So... I went out there and I'm all angry and I'm focused on all the wrong things. And, um, you know, the first round bell rung, I'm sort of I was so fired up. A woman snorting out my nose and just huffing and puffing. And I was just throwing wild haymakers, to be honest. I, I think about it, it was just horrible. Everything that went out the window that I taught, um, there was no setups. There was no, it was just 
instinct and it was just throw and throw and knock him out and when that didn't work and we're two minutes into a five minute round <laughs> and I've used up all my gas I'm thinking oh this isn't going to be good so um, you know he's chopping away at my legs front, uh, my front league leg and uh, it was starting to get sort of less and less uh, use out of it uh, then he came high with left hooks and I remember just that ringing noise in my ear when he was hitting with the uh, um, side of the um, dome there I was thinking, man, what am I going to do here? I could hear my corner yelling up, hands up. Uh, and I'm like, I think my hands are up. And I looked down and they were down. Uh, yeah, so went back to the round, um, got through the first round. Everything they were telling me, I was nodding my head. I could understand what they were saying, but uh, it was just going in there and going out there. As in my head, I was trying to tell myself, right, you've got to survive. Um, I turned around and I'm like, right, okay, let's go. And again, I came forward, trying to aggress, uh, be the aggressor, and same thing, ran out of steam. Uh, this time, the guy mounted me with about 45 seconds to go. Uh, he was dropping elbows and hammer fists and um, a couple of headbutts. He could headbutt in those days. And then the bell rung. So I made it through just. Um, but by this stage, I was pretty much gone, Fleece. And, um, yeah, the third round came and... It lasted till about I think three and a half minutes and then he got on top and we look back at the video it's like 57 unanswered blows <laughs> and uh, yeah then I'm finally out cold uh, like on about 53 I think but he got a couple of extra ones and uh, I had my mum right in the front seat uh, I had all my family all my friends all my work there uh, yeah it was a really humbling experience for me I thought shit this is this is what it is and yeah, you know, I could have either gone and hit under a rock and gone back to rugby eventually. Um, but I had good people like Howie and Johnny and us, like, get back on the horse, you know, and get back down here training. Uh, you Get back here on Monday night. We're going to watch the UFC together. And I'm um, like, I can't even walk. And, um, and they came and picked me up and we all watched the UFC. And from that point on, I was hooked, please. So, yeah, that's a bit about how it went. Man, that's, uh, it sounds like a bit of a, a nightmare debut and experience, but I think it's a testament to yourself and uh, your love for the sport and your passion for MMA that that didn't deter you and you ended up, you know, pushing on with your fight career as well as, you know, be, making it essentially uh, the major thing in your life. Uh, just to, Just like, just before we move on to some of the stuff about your coaching, uh, and your, I guess, your career when you launched your academy in Hammerhead. Um, what was what was the fighting uh, highlight for you? I guess that sounds like it was a pretty low light, but as far as, like, your highlight for your fight career, what would you say that was? Yeah, so I guess um, there's a few highlights, things that, that stand out. Um, I guess fighting in in, in, in UK was a really amazing experience um, and that's where I learned a lot about the structure behind the scenes as well with the promotions um, ha having Dave O'Donnell and Andy Gear, my, my instructors um, also promoting, I, I was able to see how they set things up, they also helped me see things as well uh, so I enjoyed that, that was a great crowd over there um, I did fight Hector Lombard but that didn't last very long, he broke my arm in three places and then he went on to do some pretty cool things um, but I guess probably my all time favourite is fighting here in my hometown like down here in Dunedin um, just because it was one of the first places to actually have um, a cage uh, tournament, uh, well, it was called Valley Tudo uh, in New Zealand so um, it was awesome to be able to fight here, it's a town that's always been a fight town um, so yeah, being able, being able to fight here and just uh, I suppose hear, that, hear the noise that the Dunedin City can make because uh, usually when I'm fighting everywhere else I'm always fighting against their, their local heroes so you, I mean, you're used to coming out getting booed <laughs> you know, especially like the UK I was fighting an Englishman and I heard everyone there uh, actually it freaked my men partner out so much that uh, she gave me the choice between MMA and her so um, yeah I'm still here with MMA um, but yeah it was, wasn't was a very wasn't a very friendly crowd they were quite hostile so I guess that's why I like fighting in uh, Dunedin 
Awesome, awesome. So let's let's get on to so your uh, your MMA career. Were you still fighting when you launched your gym? And what was I guess what was the catalyst for you deciding I'm going to start? You know, I'm going to launch Hammerhead. Um, how did you come up with that name? And like, I think within the New Zealand MMA, uh, I guess scene, the Hammerhead brand and logo, and seeing you guys come out with the moldy design, even before I knew you personally, it was always something that was very distinctive to me when I attend the MMA events in New Zealand. Yeah, like so. Yeah, what what was the story of the formation of Hammerhead and how it came to be and the whole the whole lot of it. For sure. So, okay, so um, we had Johnny Gee that I explained from Brazil uh, that came over here, uh, and also he was living at Howie Booth's house, which we were training at, and there was uh, a third person as well, Dave Burke. Uh, so Dave, he was a very good friend of Howie's. He's a very spiritual man um, and an amazing, brilliant artist, and actually this is one of his pieces behind me here, uh, but he's done a lot of work with uh, a lot of professional rugby teams and league teams like the Warriors for since um, oh, for over 10 years, I think he's been with them, as well as many other NRL teams. Um, a lot of his art's been um, commissioned by um, the government, he'd, he'd meet with a lot of his coins, they get minted as well. Um, we're just lucky to have someone like him around. So it was his vision to brand the team, Team Hammerhead. Uh, the reason was, was uh, Johnny lifted up his shorts one day and showed us his tattoo. And on his thigh, he's got this huge Hammerhead shark there. And uh, Dave's like, oh, well, this is the Māori version of that. And he had a uh, Māori party design on his arm. And now he goes, well, I've got one of them on my shoulder. And I said to him, well, Dave, you've just designed me one and I've got one on my foot. And so we all had uh, this hammerhead tattoo on us and all four of us were standing in Howie's garage um, talking about forming an MMA team. So um, Dave said that the Mung Mungu Party is a very, very strong animal. Um, and in the traditional Māori world, um, he told us a story. And when he did, we all got goosebumps. And our hairs were standing on ends and we just got this feeling like this is us. This, this is definitely going to happen. Um, and that story was was that um, when, when, when the Māori fishermen would be catching fish, the hammerhead shark was always the hardest one to kill. Um, and uh, in the ancient mythologies, it said that even when their last breath is taken and gone, uh, you'll see the fillets and the meat is still quivering and it just shows that they'll keep fighting right up until their last breaths left their body, they'll still keep fighting. So we wanted to adapt that uh, ideology for us uh, and take that into the cage with us too, just to never give up. So, um, yeah, then the branding came out and that's when Dave came into his own with the sublimated T-shirts, um, the logo, uh, and, and then from there... We started, uh, it was just myself and Johnny that were fighting. And um, then when Johnny went back to Brazil, I carried on fighting under the Hammerhead brand. And um, yeah, would take that overseas to Australia for fights and also all around New Zealand. Um, and then from there, I ran out of sparring partners. Like I realised I needed big heavyweights to spar with. I couldn't just be with the guys that were there lighter than me. Um, so I brought on a few league boys. Um, Uppy Tyre was one of them, um, and yeah, he became like because uh, he's six foot two, six foot two, and uh, 120 kgs of muscle. Uh, and I known him for a long time through work and also playing league with him, so uh, I knew that he was pretty physical and he'd be great as a training partner. So um, yeah, he was my first real sparring partner, and then he ended up sort of coming and helping me corner fight. So I fought Sam Brown. Uh, for the first New Zealand MMA title. Uh, it was a five-rounder, uh, and it was in a cage of Wellington at Rex Redden's show. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we went to a split decision. Uh, Sammy went on to do some great things uh, after that, and, uh, you know, I still bump into him every now and then, and, yeah, he's one fellow that, uh, yeah, we, we, that's probably one fight I didn't mention before. That one will always be remembered. I, I first met Carl Weber that night too, so uh, a good friend of mine and another pioneer of the sport. So, um, yeah, after we did that, up he was like, oh, do you think I could train up for a fight? Do you think you could get me a fight? And I'm like, yeah, okay. So 
we trained them up and um yeah he became my first sort of student um we were doing it down at the rugby fields and in my garage and all sorts of places and uh, he became a New Zealand heavyweight champ and had a record of 6-0 and uh, before his title fight so um, yeah it sort of grew from there um, and then up he helped me open up to the public so from there the public classes came along and that's when we faced a few difficulties because I could hand pick the people I trained in my garage. Uh, I knew they were good people. I knew that they were going to represent us and the team well and not do any silly stuff. But, um, you know, they were a bit older as well. But when I first opened up to the public, um, you know, these kids were in the prime sort of shape of their lives. They were in their early 20s. Uh, then they go out and drink after a week of working and hard work at the gym and just do dumb stuff. So, um you know, there was a lot of things that we learned along the way about culture uh, at the gym. Um, I thought it was a good idea at the start to impose like liquor bans uh, while they're in camp. And so we would enforce these liquor bans and then these uh, guys would have their fight do really well having gone party, hit the booze and again, even worse stuff would happen then. Um, so then it was like, right guys, we need to really curb this. Um, and so it took a while, it took a lot of Three in the morning phone calls from the police saying, Matt, we've got this one in here. He's done this. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll come up and grab him. Or, you know, there'll be a lot of those situations going down. And, you know, I'm, I'm promoting shows in our town, so I want to have a good um, relationship with the police. You know, they, they help us out a lot with our licences and also uh, making sure our events are um, well secured. So, you know, I think the the... Early days were definitely a testament to where we are now. We had to really lay down some foundations. Um, and, yeah, a lot of the kids that first came to us were ones from troubled backgrounds as well. So, um, yeah, I'm really proud to see that now, sort of 15 years later, those guys have got their own clubs now. They've got uh, families. They've got their own houses. You know, they're doing really well. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud proud of them all. You know, I really am pleased. Mm, that's um yeah i guess that's probably maybe something you didn't think about when you started your gym i, I guess about the positive impact you were going to have you were just like literally looking for some training partners and then maybe hey let's start a gym and that journey now of seeing people um come around to like where they are in life and you having a big part in that's amazing um so with your with the with hammerhead right at what point uh did you transition from okay my fight career is over and transition more into that that coach full coach mentor role um yeah and how did that evolve like how did hammerhead evolve and, and i guess go from like you're saying training in your in your garage to like a fully fledged business with a a lease and a facility like how did that evolve over time yeah, so um, how we started off was at the time I was just basically uh, in a in a weights gym, um, and it was just hiring out the aerobics area and using that in the weekends. So uh, what we'd have to do is every Saturday morning we could we'd have to lay our mats out, the jigsaw mats, and lay them all out on this uh, aerobic area. Uh, and my first day of opening up uh, the classes, we had thirty six people walk in uh, to start MMA. So I was uh, pretty impressed by the numbers. Um, and we would do Saturday and Sunday trainings in the weekends here. It was just twice a week. Um, and then it started getting to the point where some of our guys were starting to get quite good. Um, so some of those ones from day one were guys like Brogan Anderson, uh, Robert Dean, um, who else was there? But, uh, Chase Haley was around in those days too. So he, he was a wee bit younger, but it was more, yeah, Robert Dean and Brogan Anderson, uh, quite a few others that had gone on to Ford as well. Um, but yeah, really, those early days were. I guess the start of things and we realised we needed more training and it wasn't just enough to do uh, to compete. So um, the guy that owned the gym at the time, Gary Chalkland, had said to me, Matt, um, do you want to go into this? There's an opportunity for the building next door. It's come up uh, for lease. Um, what do you think about going down there and running classes after you finished work? And um, I thought, yeah, this is fantastic. He says, look, we've got the boxing club that's already here. They could uh, share it with you and we could um, share this facility. So 
um, it worked out really well. For a couple of years, we had this place, and then um, things got bigger. Uh, another building on the same block became available. It was even bigger for us, so we decided to move in there. Um, and when we were going into there, uh, my father had passed away, and I thought to myself, oh, um, I'm really young now, and I can have a crack at this. And I had a pretty good job at the freezing works, but I thought, no, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to leave my job. I was in charge of... Uh, Close to 150 people, uh, to 200 people at the time, um, and I'd worked my way up to a really good position there. But I just thought I could sit here in the office all day um, when I'm 50. I'll give this a crack now, and um, yeah, that's when I decided to put some of my inheritance money into this gym with my um, new partner, and um, yeah, we decided to take it to that next level. Wow, wow! What year was this, uh, Matt? That you like, yeah, that you went to the next level with Hammerhead. Yeah, so that would have been 2013. 2013. Wow, okay. So that's quite interesting because this you, you got into MMA 2003, so you'd very much, you know, you've done a solid 10 years. You had your fighting career. You've done the UK. You've, you know, you've gathered all this experience. So it was a, a really solid period. Were you still fighting at that time or were you, fought, like, just coaching? Uh, so when I, 2013, I was still fighting. Um, I was actually, uh, my last fight was, second last fight. I had, so I was fighting against um, Steve Warby um, from City Kickboxing. And um, uh, at the time, Brogan Anderson had actually decided to quit his job. And he was like, right, um, I'm going to be a personal trainer and I'm going to fight and we're going to do this. And he was taking things seriously. So I'm like, right, okay, let's switch this up. Uh, you can train me and do my strength and conditioning and um, let's get ready for this fight. And so um, basically I had all my boys coming at me for sparring. They were sharking at me and they were my own students and it was a really cool thing. And um, I was in pretty good nick for that fight with Steve and uh, it was a hell of a fight. Unfortunately, it was a bit of um, controversy. There was knees uh, to the head when I was on the ground. So uh, Steve didn't get DQ'd. Um, what had happened was was that um, he was awarded the win at the start, but then looking back at footage, they saw uh, four, uh, three to four knees, and they said, oh, we'll, we'll call it a no contest, and um, we can do it again later on down the track. And, um, yeah, so that was that was uh, it was a good scrap until then. I, I tell you what, Steve definitely hits hard that boy. He knows how to scrap. <laughs> a lot of love for him. Um yeah, and that's uh, yeah. That, that we never got to do the rematch, and um, I got a wee bit older, and um, yeah, Steve sort of had a bit of a break from fighting as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was a heck of a time. Yeah, I really enjoyed it though. So then from there, um, I did have one more fight. I did a camp in Thailand and came back and fought a heavyweight Benji uh, Kanai, who was um, he was also he's fought a lot of people as well, and. Um, we were looking at doing an in-house at our gym and looking to launch the facility and he was like, let's have a scrap. I think we were at a grappling match and uh, yeah, we, we'd, we'd had a good grapple and he's like, no, nah, we need to have a proper scrap. He's a bit of a character. So yeah, we just did it in an in-house at our event. It was cool to draw, but yeah, we had some fun. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, man. So this is, yeah, this is awesome because yeah, like uh, Stephen Warzone Warby's, you know, one of my favourite fighters to watch and pretty intense guy um so i wanted to ask you now so hammerheads established you're growing your gym you've got a stable of fighters um you know brogan's coming through he's gone full time um how tell me about the origin story and your involvement with uh, mma new zealand and how that you know and then i guess the creating of the federation and how everything came into into being like, how did that evolve? Yeah, so basically, um, uh, Gary, my business partner that I talked about before, um, we were talking to a lady, uh, Nora Phillips was her name, and I had this idea to try and... Because back when I first was having competitions and promoting shows, uh, a lot of promotions weren't getting on with each other. There's a lot of stepping on toes and a lot of people getting pissed off with coaching of fighters for their events and then they go and do events you know on the same night and it wasn't it wasn't a good 
time where it wasn't working together. So I had an idea because I came in pretty neutral and fought on a lot of these guys' shows or at least had relationships with these promoters when they were fighting, um, might have been overseas, things like that. So was able to come in from a pretty neutral stance um, on that one uh, and wanted to do like a... Uh, a regional competition where we had the best out of Otago fights, the best out of Auckland, and have sort of a, a regional, almost like the NPC rugby. Um, so we thought, well, okay, so how would we do this and how would we get this right? We need to start getting some sanctioning and governing. And then looked into it further. I was like, well, hang on, there is no real governing or sanctioning for MMA in New Zealand. Um, and I guess this is just how this started moving forward from there. So um, a federation was 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 looking to get formed, and Naira, she was actually very instrumental in trying to put this together too. Um, and we looked at um, voting in um, the right person to be present because we needed someone that was able to have the respect of all these different people um, that were like this at the time, and that person was uh, Terry Hill, who's still the president now to this day, I'm his vice president, but um, Terry Hill, um, one of the founding fathers of martial arts in this country, um, he, he he was that man to be a figurehead, and um, basically we then brought on every person that was promoting at the time, uh, every major gym owner as well, um, and then started bringing us all into the um, form of the federation so started off with an incorporated society um then it's built into now what's become a federation so uh along the way we had to do things like apply to be uh, nso a national, a national sanctioning organization for mma in the country so working together with sport new zealand there was a lot of things that they needed to see uh different standards practices and protocols adhered to uh they wanted to know our visions for the future uh, how we see sort of things playing out uh, with sort of short-term and long-term, mid-term visions. So, um, yeah, a lot of work was done behind the scenes to make that happen. Um, and then since then, we were able to become that um, sanctioning organisation. Uh, we became a part of the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation, um, IMF, and we were under their body um, at the time. Um, and a lot of things with IMF going to their world championships each year uh, and attending um, a lot of their events and then in turn hosting events as well, Oceanias and things like that. So that was a big part of, of our first uh, sort of decade of building the Federation. Um, unfortunately, we've just left IMF recently uh, just due to some things that we just feel uh, too hard for us to be a part of right now. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but we just feel it's not a good environment for us to be taking our young fighters over to. Um, the structure and the way that it's set up is absolutely amazing. Uh, but there's just a little bit of things that we experienced firsthand that made us think this is not a even playing ground and also it's not a safe place for some of us to bring these uh, students to. So um, we hope that they'll fix their standards and we can get back there. But in the meantime, um, the Federation is just happy going and fighting other individual countries. Um, we've got an event in Tahiti next weekend. Uh, we'll look to have uh, tournaments with the Australians and have an Oceania um, and then possibly look at uh, something over in the States as well as on the cards. So we'll see how that pans out. But, um, you know, the Federation basically has been um, instrumental in creating pathways uh, for people that want to get into things like uh, refereeing, Cutman, uh, courses for coaching, courses for judging. Um, so you can start finding pathways outside of just fighting uh, or owning a gym. So, yeah, I've, I've really loved doing that side of things too, seeing it grow uh, and now trying to take it to the next level as well. That's, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the history. This is awesome to document this history because I'm sure a lot of this stuff isn't on uh, video. And, um, yeah, Terry Hill, I had the privilege of doing my refereeing and judging courses with Terry. Yeah, and it's, I, it's a real badge of honour, you know, to have my certificate from Terry just knowing how much of a legend he is in the uh, New Zealand martial arts. Um, so that's very interesting, and um, thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to move on to 
another topic and i think a lot of people don't realize i didn't realize this right till you told me about this but people probably aren't aware that you created the bucket list um which was actually and and the story you told me about uh wimp to warriors and how that all formed so the formation of the bucket list which is your i guess uh, MMA experience where people can go on and as a you know as a new a newbie and go do a camp and participate um, in an MMA fight. I'm very curious, and I'm sure like people would love to hear the story about how the bucket list was formed, how that relates to Wimp to Warriors, which is now called Alter, and that origin story. Could you tell me about that? Yeah. So look, basically, it's a really small world, place and um. So we had this, uh, this this chat. I can't remember exactly when it was, but I had this chat with my then business partner Gary Falkin, and we were talking about having. Um, and it, it was around the time of Ultimate Fighter um, coming out, and they had the house, and we were really wanting to replicate something like that, where we could have people coming and living at our gym and we were thinking about even trying to put up rooms and they could come and stay there, we could film the whole thing and then have this sort of fight off uh, to the end. Uh, and then we thought about, um, hang on, why don't we look at doing some something along the lines of we don't have to just have pro fighters because there's not enough around and not enough to actually bring here. Why don't we just try and do it out of everyday people? Um, and so we were talking about this idea um and at the time there was a lady that had come over from australia and she was she was looking at basically how we were training because she was working um with some australians or sorry it was a uk man who was living in australia on a um similar thing to what we were just talking about so she was wanting to learn some techniques and she basically was here for a few days saw us training and then later on she said to us hey um would you like to speak to this guy? I think you've got a similar concept. So that man ended up being a guy called Richie Cranny. And uh, Richie Cranny was the founder of Want to Warrior. And he was telling us about his concept. And we were saying, well, hang on, we've got this concept. And it was quite a hard case. So he was sort of trying to sell his one to us. And we were like, oh, hang on, mate, we've already got this one here. We're going to look to run it. And so everything was fine. They carried on doing their thing, and we started it uh, pretty much that year. And so Bucket List was formed in New Zealand, and I didn't know anything about how they did their setup, and they didn't know anything about how we did our setup. And to be honest, every year the syllabus evolves, um, things that we learned from the year before, we always update that. But, um, yeah, we started off with the Bucket List one, and we're coming up to our, not, our 10th anniversary next year. So um, a lot lot going on um, with the Bucket List. But, yeah, we were, ended up being the first um, uh, corporate MMA show in New Zealand. Uh, and then later on, Richie had decided to come to New Zealand. But in that time as well, and Richie had also become the president of the Australian Mixed Martial Arts Federation. And uh, I got to know him very well through that. And so we were going overseas together quite quite a bit, over to the Middle East and over to all these different shows. And so we were talking and it was quite a hard case because I had the bucket list. He had Want to Warrior. Uh, he was looking at taking it to city kickboxing. I had the bucket list at Dan Hooker's gym. <laughs> it was kind of like we were going side by side. But at Throughout the whole time, we never had any issues at all. Like We were always very professional with that side of things. But uh, Richie has since sold it now, and it has been rebranded to Alta. Um, and he's also not involved with the Australian Federation anymore. So we still keep in touch. You know, he's a good friend of mine. Um, but, yeah, it's really hard case about how, um, how it all sort of formed. And with our show as well, we were... Um, I suppose the big major difference was this, it was a um, started off as an eight week boot camp, uh, then we built it out to a ten week boot camp, and now it's where it is now. It's twelve weeks, and we feel that twelve weeks is a good amount of time to get everything covered instead of rushing things. Um, and at the time, uh, Wiptor was doing a half yearly thing, so they were looking at twenty five weeks, um, twenty four to twenty five weeks, so a bit of a longer one. Um, and I just felt that for us in Dunedin, and the whole reason I probably didn't adopt it was also uh, because I just didn't feel like people could dedicate half a year to it uh, here in Dunedin. So um, 
especially after they're used to doing the shorter one that we'd already introduced. So, yeah, it was it was a it was a cool thing, um, and I love it. I think the bucket list is probably uh, something that I think that will help not only people that sign up to do it, but it helps gyms as well. So the gyms that have it in there, you get uh, a good influx of people that are there just looking to learn to fight. Then they go and have their tournament. After that, most of them are looking for a place to carry it on, and they go back to that gym, and it's just a really good formula. Um, the shows are amazing too because, like, I run professional events with XFC, um, but our crowds at the bucket list are always uh, bigger because everyone wants to see that first-time fighter. Uh, everyone wants to see their nephew, their son, their cousin, their mate from high school have their first scrap. And, uh, you know, the good thing is, is that in these camps, they're, they're talking about it the whole time for 12 weeks. It's parents, oh, I've done this this morning. Or well, their workmates, yeah, we had to do this last night. Or I got choked out or we learned how to do this. And, yeah, it just self-promotes itself. So, yeah, it's a really good concept. Yeah, that, that's amazing. You know, like it really shows that you are a true pioneer, that you were right there, at, you know. The formation of these things like New Zealand MMA and you created the bucket list, which is like right there side by side with Wimps the Warrior. I'm a little bit familiar with it because I got 10 weeks into Wimps the Warrior when I was at CKB, but unfortunately then COVID hit, so I never got to have the full experience. But sort of having seen how the program works, and knowing how um, life-changing it could be because, I mean, it's like when I was in the military, right? There's nothing like the fear of death to make you turn up to training. And that yes. it's, it's way more serious than like, okay, guys, we're doing 12 weeks to lose some weight. It's like, no, we're doing 12 weeks to um, represent yourself in front of your family and not get your ass beat in front of everybody, It's which is um, a massive incentive to want to do the training uh so I, I think it's it's incredible that you're doing that and i and it's a testament to the success of your program that you had you just had an event right and now you've, you're on to the next one and how many uh so how many people have you got signed up for the next a uh, next event coming up the next bucket list well, it's, it's crazy fleece so usually but the most i've ever had is 36 people um and i always thought then like if we got to 40 i have to cap it there um, and so we just had this last event uh, a month ago, and then I've put the registrations out for the next one that's starting in February. Um, I had to cap it now, and uh, so when I actually did cap it and told everyone on social media, stop, registrations are closed, uh, another 14 entries came through. So uh, this one has got 54 people in it for next year. Um, so it will be our biggest bucket list ever. That's um, that's incredible. That's really incredible, and uh, I'm I'm just stoked. And yeah, I can see how this business model, seeing seeing it at CKB, knowing that the model is going into like I didn't realize you'd I, I now it clicks in my head that I saw, uh, the bucket list at Combat Academy with Dan, but I didn't realize that he was using your model, and now I oh wow, um, so that's really awesome, but. Sort of like getting, speaking of Dan and CKB and these sorts of things, um, probably the last thing I want to cover in this part one of this podcast is your experience being involved with the UFC. Um, what has been your involvement at that level, at the highest level? And uh, yeah, like let's start with that and then we'll, we'll pick into it and, and speak about a few details. What, what sort of involvement do you have with the UFC and have you had? Yes, yeah, so I guess um, uh, when UFC first came to New Zealand, uh, we hadn't really established ourselves uh, as a federation um, as properly as we could have. Uh, and at the time, we were waiting for the NSO to come through from Sport New Zealand. Um, so that was when James Tohona fought here. So the first UFC, uh, basically, I bought a ticket and I watched it and uh, thought this was amazing. Uh, James was a friend of mine. I trained with him. And, um, yeah, we fought on the same cards together as well back in the day. So uh, it was really cool to see him main eventing here uh, in Auckland. So uh, I went and watched that. Um, but then the second time around, when they came to New Zealand, we were established as the NSO uh, and also um, had set up as a commission as well um, for 
uh, combat, or not for combat sports, sorry, for mixed martial arts. So um, basically, this time, uh, New Zealand uh, was able to supply referees and judges um, and also um, inspectors, which basically are, are part of the officials' role as well. Um, so basically, things like um, going to the weigh-ins, just, just, just making sure that everything was done correctly, all the procedures were followed, uh, and making sure that uh, every country and every combat authority sometimes have a slight variation on rules, usually to do with like weight increments and things like that. So just making sure that everyone was well aware of what the New Zealand standard was at the time. So, um, yeah, we've been lucky to have that role each time um, since, uh, well, UFC's come to New Zealand. And, um, yeah, we've been able to do things like organise um, poor fetties for them at the last one. Um, we had um, a really amazing experience uh, with the old Aki Marae and the Nati Fatu Iwi kindly hosting the Paul Ferdy for us and um, we were bringing on first of all the New Zealand based fighters um, and then we brought on the uh, overseas based fighters so Paul Felder um, and a lot of those guys came on to that which was a really amazing experience um, and what a beautiful marae they have overlooking um, the, the water at Mission Bay and that from the hill so um, yeah we, we basically do a lot of that work um, and at this stage uh, that's kind of really our involvement with uh, the UFC um, as a federation um, for me personally we're a few hats obviously so um, it's that's my main sort of role is to assist Terry with that. Um, and we've got our group of officials that we have. Uh, we have Neil Swales and Mark Craig that are our main officials in New Zealand and also Howie Booth in the South Island. And through them, we're bringing up uh, more and more uh, referees and judges um, through them so that we can have a good quality team. Uh, quite often we'll get uh, asked about um, different shows. So a lot of our referees will do a lot of the shows on this side of the world, uh, Singapore, China, uh, some of the Middle Eastern ones as well. Um, but yeah, it sort of it works out really well. We've got a good crew of people now that are getting a good standard and starting to lift up too. Awesome, awesome. It's um, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, like Mark Craig and Neil Swells are obviously legends, you know, and they're not only um, legends, but just. This is what I find about some of the people you're talking about, the Terry, Mark, Neil, and very approachable, really approachable and very helpful. You know, like you, they'll help you with anything. And uh, true martial artists, you know, like who where there, it's all about the sport and the development of the sport. Uh, and that's what I love about that. And I, I love the New Zealand that we do work together because I have seen at times where that maybe isn't, quite there but it seems like we're in a really really good spot with all of the gyms working together to, to move new zealand mma forward which is awesome yeah yeah it is it's in a really good spot yeah. Well, I guess we're starting to flourish uh, at all levels too. Um, obviously, the stuff at the pro level that uh, the boys at City Kickboxing are doing is amazing. Um, putting our country on the map uh, at a professional level. Um, every year we've been to the IMF tournaments, uh, we were bringing back medals, and then we were the country that had the record for the most consecutive gold medals uh, up until we uh, left that uh Federation, so we're very proud of what we've done there at an amateur level, and seeing a lot of those ones coming through now too has been uh, fantastic to see them come through the pro ranks. So um, pros and amateurs are really healthy right now, and that is due to a lot of uh, one healthy activity and constant fighting on the shows, um, having good promotions, staying solid for the fighters, uh, and then two um, clubs working together as well. That that's that's a big thing as well. Yeah, it seems like yourself, um, Jason Forster in Auckland, and uh, Carlo in Hamilton, right? Um, you guys yes. are really running the, the bulk of the events at the moment, which is awesome. Um, so what do you, you know, maybe we'll wrap it, wrap it on this. What do you see coming over the next, say, five years, not only for yourself, and what you're doing at Hammerhead, but you know, for New Zealand MMA in, in general, like yourself 
and the MMA industry in New Zealand? Yeah, well, I guess uh, for me personally, I know what's up immediately, and it's a hip replacement. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I knew I have, was having problems with my hip, but now after just last week having MRIs and seeing specialists, uh, I'm going to have to get it cut out and then put some titanium in. So, um, you know, that's going to obviously give me a bit of downtime from being able to be too physically involved in at the gym but I need to start sort of planning for that now um, and having making sure that the, the place will run uh, while I'm recovering and getting that sorted out too so I think um, at the moment just getting that sorted out um, then looking to the future of MMA um, while while we're trying to establish and do bigger things with the Federation, there's more and more work that's starting to get required there as well. And we've got a lot of building to do there too. So um, I guess that is something that I definitely want to keep, keep very involved with, uh, trying to help the growth there. Um, and assist Terry be his, be his right-hand man um, and help him help him with whatever he needs and you know immediate thing really is to uh, make sure that um, MMA is carrying on being um, delivered safe and delivered well in this country uh, and that we can grow it, grow it the best we can so I see myself looking doing those sorts of roles um, I would love to see more involvement from the Pacific Islands as well in the MMA. Like uh, a lot of them have got established boxing communities, but not not mixed martial arts. Um, so maybe even giving them some guidelines, uh, giving them some structures as well, uh, so that they too could possibly uh, have their own federations. So um, I do see a lot of work uh, in development and um, a lot of stuff that I could be useful to here yeah, to do and help out there. Hammerhead though, we'll always keep we'll always keep what going too, please. What are, your, what are your goals for Hammerhead? Yeah, I was just about to say. So Hammerhead goals at this stage, um, I'm building up. Uh, so so we go through cycles with fighters. It's always a cycle thing. Um, you know, people there's a shelf life to be a pro fighter, um, and even just to be in camp and do all the things to learn from being a novice to an amateur to pro level. You know, it's a five to six year process, easy, minimum, um, for a lot of these ones, and uh, from start to finish. So once once you go through that cycle, it's bringing in the new ones, so keep, keep evolving them. And um, obviously we talked about guys like Brogan before. Um, Brogan's up at City now, and, you know, we've had to now start to try and find who our next team captain's going to be, the next one to start leading the next group of people through so uh in the meantime i've got uh, a good stable off the last bucket list of fighters uh so there's i think 12 that put their name down to um fight again and then i also gave out six scholarships on the night as well uh to guys that extreme performed um extremely well so um yeah we've got those ones that we're bringing through uh, plus this next lot of 54 that we've got going, uh, plus my other fighters that are always coming on through as well. So it's just a matter of just keeping the camp going and getting them matched, getting them on, getting them on cards and saying, right, you're on here, you're on over here, getting the chalkboard done up and then everyone knows where they're going and the camp starts for everyone. So, yeah, basically um, we're going to hit the ground running in 2024 um, and a lot to get through. So... Immediate plans is to bring all them up to speed, uh, get a captain um, assigned for this new team, and then uh, look at um, obviously upskilling a few more coaches for when I do have to go under the knife. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm really hoping that uh, Brogan gets a, a break with the UFC. That'd be really cool. Um, yeah, he's one of my favorite fighters and just a oh. really nice guy and his partner actually really nice people um but thanks matt i feel really privileged that we've been able to sit down and talk for around about an hour and document a lot of that i think um i know everybody within new zealand martial arts knows you and knows um you know of you but it was you know a real privilege to sit down with you and actually dig out some of these details and document this history i think it's really important but we are going to do an episode two we're at another time um and we're going to come back and talk about nfts which is where we 
obviously we're both uh mma and martial arts fanatics but we're also uh fanatics in nfts and web3 so and we've got our own projects both of us so really looking forward to having that chat so stay tuned everybody come back and watch episode two um but yeah thanks for joining us matt really appreciate it man appreciate you too mate thank you very much awesome bro talk soon buddy